Listen and watch, for soon the rejoicing will begin. I invite you to take a moment and to greet one another in the name of the Christ. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, please join me as we pray our prayer for Advent. God's love has been made known among us, for God has sent Christ into the world that all people might live. My friends, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us. Let us worship God and seek to love as God has loved us. The first scripture this Lord's Day is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses one through four. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christmas Day to say 
joy as we prepare for the birth of the Christ child. second scripture this Lord's Day is in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all genera generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his Lord Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. This is the word of the Lord. The well-known survivor of the Holocaust Elie Wiesel was once asked what he hoped he would be accomplished by remembering the atrocity of the Holocaust. And his answer has stayed with me. He said, remembering the Holocaust would keep people from indifference, for it was this indifference that had allowed the Holocaust 
to become a reality. And every now and again, I return to that answer when I wonder why I am doing what I'm doing. And as that advent clock ticks closer to Christmas, what starts out as that glorious hustle and bustle can quickly become a tangled maze. And if our focus remains centered on only the superficial and meeting arbitrary deadlines, it's very easy to find yourself saying, why bother? I don't think I'm going to do this much anymore. Does anybody really care? It's when your focus shifts. It shifts to the spiritual that you can say, yes, someone cares. My family cares. My church cares. And when you get right down to the very essence of Christmas, you can say, I care. During this Advent season, all that we do with our trees and our decorations, our beautiful, beautiful music, for the luncheons that we hold and any other celebrations that we have. They, these things are our response to the mystery of faith. It points beyond anything that is real and tangible in our limited lives. Each one of us is here this day because we believe. And it's only when we neglect to praise or that we fail to enter into the mystery that we do so at our own peril because it only takes a very short lapse to begin to forget altogether. A very good example of this is um, when the former Soviet Union, which had been 70 years without any type of religion at all, was dissolved. And suddenly any underground churches or synagogues or temples were able to be out in the open. What people discovered was that the Jews had no recon recollection of their religion. They were socially and culturally Jewish. They were not religiously Jewish. They also found that the Christians were only the elderly who remembered it from their childhoods before it had been banned. And so you see, in a span of 70 years, if you try hard enough, you can almost wipe out any semblance of faith within a people. So as we anticipate the coming of the Christ, we're reminded that each one of us is a link we are connected to each other, and we need to hold tightly so that we can prepare to hear God's voice breaking through. Because you see, God's voice will break through against all odds. As a child, much of my childhood religion was Catholic. And I can remember them saying that we needed to pray for the Soviet Union and for the Soviet bloc countries that, um, that it might break down and that the faith might be restored. And I have to say that as a child, I, you know, I mean, I wasn't a tiny child, but I still would think to myself, that's never going to happen. 
It's just never going to happen. This is a continent of united um, countries, and they have chosen not to believe in God, and yet they constantly, constantly asked us to pray and to pray again for the downfall of the Soviet Union. Did those prayers work? You tell me. So that which is out of our control can be taken up by God to give us light once again. This morning I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Mary, mother of Jesus. Mary is a paradigm. She's an example of listening and responding. Her soul wakes to God's call and she says, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Bill read parts of that or much of that for us. It's very poetic and it's almost poetic musings, but it's filled with great risk-taking and great challenge, greater than any challenge that the Soviet Union posed in the modern world. You see, through the ages, Mary has evolved into um, a romantic figure. She exists in this vacuum She's undisturbed by life's comings and goings. We don't really see her as a human being. It's been so long and, well, it's, you know, married, yeah, whatever. But if you think for a moment about what it was like for women in the time of Jesus, in those days before the church was formed, before J Jesus comes to earth, you will understand exactly why what she said without hesitation resonates throughout history. The condition of women in those days was that they were property, flat out, no dispute, they were property. They were also deemed unworthy to learn or to be taught the Torah. No man would dare to speak to them in public or to even approach them or to touch them, as in a handshake. And the rabbis debated do women have souls? Women, do you have a soul? Tell me if you have a soul. Shake your head, yes. Do you have a soul? Okay, amen. Think of the audacity. And here is just the piece de resistance. Each morning, upon waking, men prayed, thank you, God, for not making me a woman. Sorry, guys, I'm not bashing you. These are the olden times. That was a woman's reality. How does that feel? Awful. And yet, when it is the impossible, that is when God steps in and God reaches out to those who are the least among us. And so this little piece of property who's 14 years old or so, who is not deemed worthy to study God's word, and every man is grateful that he's not her, 
she becomes the chosen one to bring God's son into the world. So it was very high risk for her, very high risk. And I doubt that she really thought too much about it, except to say, yes, here am I, a servant of the Lord. It wasn't cozy, and it wasn't cute, and it wasn't romantic. Picture yourself as Mary, or even as Joseph, because he always sort of gets left out of things. But now he's engaged to someone who is already carrying a child. Walk through that reality. What do they have going for them? If we look at it from a secular, uh, tangible reality, they have nothing going for them. But if we are able to reach up and see the spiritual, they have everything going for them. That is the power of God in our world and in our lives. You have to remember that the Messiah was not expected or anticipated in the way that Mary is told it would happen. She's just a good Jewish girl. She has accepted her place in life. She has lived with the doctrine and the dogma that defines her faith. And she's really just interested in going about life day to day. But that's not going to happen. Not that way, no. She is going to receive a call. And when she receives that call, she's going to accept it. And when she accepts it, again, everything switches up. Everything changes. And she has to start to think about God in a new way. Think about her world in a new way. And what, the, what part she plays in salvation history. She couldn't go on as a young Jewish girl who was property, a young Jewish girl who could not read the Torah, a young Jewish girl who um, was deemed unfit she had to let go of all of those notions, notions that created the world that she understood. She had to trust God, and she had to grow in that process to make it her own. Each one of us, each one of us, is called. And we are called just as Mary is called because we are offered the opportunity to magnify the Lord in our souls. We are offered the opportunity to be as mirror images of God's love and truth and beauty and peace in this world. But we have to move beyond that which is the secular, that which is around us that we deem immutable and unmovable. Because we have to be as Mary was and respond in unlikely ways. We have to say, I believe. We have to say, I accept the challenge. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If we want our souls to reflect God in this world, a world that for our times is beyond crazy, beyond understanding, 
then we have to accept that God is going to reach out to us in new ways. We cannot say it has always been done like this. I don't want to change. I like it the way it is. We have to pray more. We seriously, we seriously have to pray more. We need to be lifted up into the spiritual realm that prayer provides for us in order to really hear God speaking to us. And we must study the Bible more. We must. Otherwise, it's merely my ignorance combating your ignorance. We can have lots of ideas about things, but the truth, God's truth, is in his word. One of the prophets said, without the vision, the people perish. And that particular phrase has been just going over and over in my head, day and night, over the last few months. Without the vision, the people perish. It's a warning to us. It's a warning that we cannot lapse into indifference. The birth of the Christ child didn't just happen in some far off place called Bethlehem. It happened here as well, right here at First Presbyterian Church in Stewart. And it's born anew in each and every one of us. And so I charge you and I do it with the most, in a most humble way. I charge you to think in new ways, to think about this church and what we mean in the world, because we mean something or we wouldn't be here. Think about new ideas and and Sunday school, and renewing the congregation. Think about new visions. You see, God births us into wholeness. And Advent, Advent is our waiting time. It is our time to listen to God's voice, to respond to the challenge so that each one of us might accept the blessing that as our souls magnify the God essence, we will witness against indifference and we will offer the baby a better place to be born. Amen. Indeed, may we go forth to tell it on every mountain and in every valley, on every street corner, that Jesus Christ is born. Go forth from here, feeling that joy and in that anticipation. And may God bless you now and always. Amen.
Thank you.